It is absolutely a huge honor today to have Diane Thompson on of the DentalPerformanceInstitute.com. And the reason this show is such a hit is because I'm able to get quality guests like Diane, a dental practice operations and financial analyst by trade. Diane is clients and industry trusted advisors praise her most for being innovative, honest, direct, and professional. Her approach incorporates a focused 360-degree assessment of business operations and financials, its leader exploring visions, goals, and entrepreneurial DNA, and their teams helping an organization to see what is holding them back from increasing revenues, improving efficiencies, and advancing their business growth goals. With 30 years of dental industry experience, which means she must have started when she was 12, which includes <laughs> 17 years of business consulting and coaching expertise. Diana specializes in startup practices, organizing, standardizing, and improving practice operations, patient and referral based retention, financial growth, increasing brand awareness, new business development, team building and communication, internal and external conflict management, transitions, acquisitions, and compliances. As part of her process, she helps clients set up and implement the training and team building programs required to ensure that the cultural and other changes needed for growth to occur will continue and stay with a practice or dental corporation well into the future. Diana sees through the white noise and helps underperforming businesses turn around and revitalize their business operations in a timely manner. Diana, what, what, what I see as the biggest problem that guys like you have is the fact that Everybody I know that's crushing it, you know, I, I've been doing it 30 years from 87 mm -hmm. to 2016. They always have had a consultant in every three or four years. They've had a consultant. And that's why they're all doing a million and a half, two and a half, three and a half million. But when I'm out in the field, the ones that need you the most, they never get a consultant. But they don't blink at buying a laser or a CAD cam or a CB. They'll, they'll buy any shiny toy. I always say to yourself, you double your business if you covered yourself in aluminum foil and put some red blinking dots on and <laughs> called yourself a laser, you'd probably sell yourself all day long. So do you see that too, that most of your clients are already above average success and want to go even more? Or are you doing turnarounds of dire straits? You know what, it's actually both. And it's interesting that you bring this up because when we work with clients, after we do our discovery and find out what they're looking for or even where they're at, there's two categories that they have to be in parallel with. And the first is they have to be practice ready and they have to be mind ready. If they're practice ready, but their mind isn't ready to bring in a coach, a consultant or what have you, it's never gonna work. It's never going to, there's not gonna be no collaboration there. But let's say they are um, mind ready, but for some reason their practice isn't ready. Again, if those two are not parallel, it's not going to work. So that's the first part of, of your comment question. The second part is actually we see both sides of the coin. We see clients and we work with clients and we're just not local to Chicago. We work with clients throughout the country and we see clients that either, you know, they they're doing well and they just want to get over that potential hump. But then we also see clients that, you know, they're going to the bank to make their payroll. <laughs> so, you know, it, it really just depends on what the situation is in, is and the scenario of those dentist and their dental practices, male, female, what have you, uh, of, you know, how we work with them. So, so, um, the reason podcasts are so successful and exploding is because they're, they're at the expense of radio. Um, mm -hmm. radio is, is half, um, advertising and talk and, and then they, you know, whatever. And plus I think it's the, uh, the burnout from the election. People just don't want to wake up in the morning and hear more crap about the election. <laughs> and so right now I want you to do me a favor. They're, they're driving to work. Uh, probably 85% of our viewers are telling me they got an hour commute. It doesn't matter if they're urban or rural. Mm -hmm. And my job is I know if I can get them to, uh, get a consultant, it's going to be 10 times the return on investment than if they get a laser or a CBCT or a shiny toy. And, but, but they're, but I don't know why they don't do it. So what I want you to do is paint pictures of who's calling you, what's their scenario. Um, and I'm also, I believe that a lot of dentists, they don't even know what's going on dysfunctional, crazy in their office. Cause when you're in there, when they get done doing the root canal, they walk up, they go to their office and they go in there and shut the door. I mean, their front office could be having an international drug cartel running up there and they, they wouldn't even know it. So try to try to paint some pictures. So this dentist driving to work kind of sees, oh, that red flag might be in my office. And you're saying I can fix that. 
Okay, I'll give you three scenarios. The first one that comes to mind is, as you mentioned, the team. You know, the doctor is back there doing their dentistry, practicing the art of dentistry. They have an office manager or some level of manager that they're relying on to uh, run the practice, manage the practice, manage the numbers, and then all of a sudden it comes crashing down because either the office manager or the management isn't doing their job and the team is so frustrated, now it's all coming down to the doctor. So usually that happens toward the end of the day, or I see it happen a lot of times on the weekend so then the doctor's trying to find a way to correct the situation so that's when they start getting online and you know looking at what others are doing and maybe they can implement that into their practice so that's one bomb that usually goes off another bomb that goes off that I am seeing more and more and more is that the practices uh, income meaning the insurance checks the checks coming over the counter the payments coming in are not matching the bank statements so unfortunately that goes into a position of that the red flag goes up of are we being embezzled on i'm seeing that more and more actually we i just talked to somebody this morning about that um the third scenario as i said is the doctor is just burnt out and they they've been practicing and they're to a point where the whole administrative process is just weighing them down because they want to practice the art of dentistry. They have to deal with the administrative and they cannot find the balance. So those are the three top scenarios that we're seeing now. And I'm not even going to talk about new practice startup because that's actually, you know, an area that's more of a positive and it's something that these clients are looking forward to. So with the first scenario, with anytime you're dealing with team, you know, somebody has to come in and evaluate that team what was happening. Uh, and, you know, we can come in and do that and put together some level of training program, you know, do is, you know, uh, one of the authors out there, do you have the right people sitting in the right seats of the bus? Are they on the right bus, just not in the right seat? Or do they need to get off the bus altogether? We can come in and evaluate that. Uh, the second scenario with the possible embezzlement is we can come in and we can do a financial analysis, not only on you know, the software system, profit and loss bank statements and see what's going on there and recommend if the practice needs to take it to a higher level of working with the company that can help them to see what's going on. And then, you know, with the third uh, uh, category that I was talking about is that, you know, being the doctor just burned out, it's like sometimes they just need somebody to talk to and throw some ideas past. And that's why we offer, you know, a complimentary, complimentary consultation to speak with them to see, you know, what we can do for them and just sometimes let them vent because, uh, you know, Sometimes they don't have people around them that they can vent to, especially if it's team members, management, or, you know, what have you. Those are the top three scenarios I'm seeing right now. And, you know, it's funny because we're, we're talking right now during the Olympics, and all the most gifted athletes I know personally, know in Phoenix, whatever, play for the Cardinals, whatever, the Suns, mm -hmm. um, they all have a coach, a personal mm -hmm. trainer. And most dentists would think, well, if I was that good, if I was playing for the Cardinals, I, I wouldn't need a coach or a trainer. I mean, I'm just all that. And mm -hmm. and that's why uh, I always thought consultants, I couldn't, I can never really tell if a dental consultant is a consultant or a psychologist because you're that per they're burned out because they don't have a buddy, a friend, a coach, a personal trainer that can get their head in the game and that they need to be listened to. They, they need to be heard and then you need to pump great information in their head and if, if you want to get a gold medal, you're going to have to have a coach. No, I agree with you. And you know what? I even just in the last six months, I've talked to a couple doctors because we've been doing a lot of uh, meetings and workshops and things. And some of the doctors are telling us that when they hear that word consultant, they really get scared. They're like, I don't want a consultant. They're going to tell me what to do. And I don't think that I think the perception with the de with dentists that we just even over here or even speak with us is that, you know what, you know, we want somebody that's going to come in and that we're going to be able to trust that's going to allow us to make the decision, but guide us in the direction that we need to, no matter what direction that is. So I've actually been changing, you know, I'm not your consultant, our company, we're your trusted advisory partners. And for some reason, just the wordplay is actually changing mindset of the dentist that we're talking to. It's amazing. Well, you know what you should call yourselves to really make them feel warm and fuzzy? <laughs> call yourself a dental divorce attorney. <laughs> they love divorce right attorneys. Now. I'm going to tell you right now, if I um, had the licensure to prescribe medications, yeah, I would probably say 90% would be on some level. <laughs> so so um, 
they're they're wondering, you know, I can't get embezzled from because I mean, my reception is surely she she was the godmother of my my child. I mean, she she was the godmother at the baptism. And Amy Lou, I mean, she went to high school with my sister. I mean, um, they just always don't think that that lady would do that. Um, what are the red flags of embezzlement? And, and tell me this: is 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 one way to get rid of most embezzlement to say, hey, the cancel checks go to my house. Mm -hmm. Only me, the dentist, can sign the check, and I'm going to break up the functions at the front. Like one person can go get the mail, make the deposit, or you know, break it up just so that it takes two people to embezzle. If the doctor signing the checks, the canceled checks come home, and two people um, have to go in on it together, does that get rid of most embezzlement or not really? Okay, so I just want to put a disclaimer in here. We are not an embezzlement company, but we definitely know what to look for. And if we see certain signs, we bring it to the doctor's attention with proof, and then we recommend another company. But there are the bottom line is if somebody wants to steal from the office, they're going to find any way to do it for whatever reason that they're doing it. And there's so many different scenarios that I've even learned over the last four years that it's it, it's it's mind boggling. So, for example, one of the a couple red flags is when I hear uh, that, you know, an office isn't uh, closing out the end of the month in the computer system. There's always reasons why they do that you know, depending on insurances and claims and things of that nature, and I get it, but every month the uh, practice management software system should be closed out so it can balance forward all the balances and we're good to go. Um, also too, you know, the checks coming in, the insurance checks coming in. Um, are they being processed in the computer system properly? Are they being stamped or are they being signed by somebody in the office? Um, I've also seen uh, offices that have the doctor stamp their his name, his or her name stamp. Um, I highly recommend getting rid of those stamps um, and having, you know, patients actually handwrite the practice name or the doctor name on the check if it's coming over the counter. Um, a couple other areas that we've seen, again, the bank statements aren't uh, what's going into the bank that says on the uh, end of day or end of week or end of month report is not actually what's going into the bank. So, you know, once you see that, I mean, that that's a huge red flag. Uh, so it really, you know, it really just depends. I've also seen accounts where, you know, money's taken from one account, putting on another account in another family, then taken off to that account. And it's kind of like the double dutch rope. It's It's the accounts are being transferred to all these other different accounts. Um, and once you start to do that, that's an absolute nightmare because then you, then you have to have somebody come in and fix those accounts. And there's people out there that can do that, but it is a hassle and is very labor intensive. Okay. If, um, you know, I've, I've been doing this for 30 years. And if I asked a hundred dentists, what, what is the number one thing that stresses you out? What, what keeps you up at night? What makes you almost nauseous sometimes? It, it's always going to be their staff. Uh, mm -hmm. they're, they're actually afraid of their staff. They, they, they say, man, I wish I could just tell my hygienist, blah, 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 blah. And so we'll, we'll go talk to her. What, so, so talk people. What, first of all, why are dentists all afraid of their staff? Why is the people part of the equation the most stressful? I mean, it's not their bonding agent. It's not yeah. finding their crown and bridge lab. It's not their impression material. It's their hygienist, their assistant, their receptionist. You know, talk, talk about that. I think, uh, to answer your question, I think the number one challenge that dentists have is the communication with their team, whether it's individual or collectively. And sometimes they just don't know how to communicate. And then because they're working in close quarters, it starts to go from being, you know, I'm your boss, I'm your manager, you're an employee to being your friend. And once you cross that line, it's hard to come back from that because then if you have to course correct or, con or consult with an employee or terminate that employee, then not only does the communication go down the drain, but so does the direction of how you, you should really be working with that employer to employee business relationship. You know, a lot of people always uh, think they're a genius because they can point out that, you know, half the planet's boys and half are girls, or they can point out the pigment in their skin and say, oh, you're Asian, you're Mexican. But I think the hardest thing to pick out is the mindset of a, of a baby boomer versus a generation nexter versus a millennial. And I've heard so many baby because how people think has a hell of a lot more to do than their whether they're bald or fat or tall or you know or whatever. But it seems like a lot of baby boomers my age in their fifties look at a lot of millennials and we just you always hear them saying at the bar, 
Well, she wouldn't have all those problems if she wasn't going to happy hour with them and getting mani petties with them and, and being their girlfriend. I mean, so, so I want you to talk specifically. Um, what I can't be your boss and be your best friend because mm -hmm. I can't fire my best friend and I can't tell my best friend if you're late one more time, five minutes, I'm going to fire. So what are, what are specific lines of uh, not crossing? I, I'm your boss. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. not your friend, but millennials want to be friends. They want to, you know, so, so how, how do you coach someone on that? What, what's too close? What's too far? Well, my professional opinion, what's too close is that there's a difference between taking the entire team out to a function. And then there's a difference with only going out with a couple of your employees to a function. It, prior to even making a decision like that is thinking to yourself, is this going to be on a professional level or is somebody going to take that out of context that now we're friends and everybody has a different motivation. And the only way to figure out what that motivation is to ask questions and communicate with your team members on an individual level. Um, but, you know, go, I unfortunately have seen, you know, dentists go out with one or two of their team members after work and then the other team feels like they're uh they were they weren't invited because these other two people went out then that causes animosity and then that starts to cause animos animosity between team members and there's just no need for that so what you know even being a professional myself with our team members you know again a, a, a group meeting and a group outing is one thing but when you start to go out separately that's something totally different that i would probably recommend avoiding okay i want to ask you um two macroeconomic questions when i got out of school 30 years ago you just took your cost you added your profit you submitted your price to the insurance company and they just paid a percent you know 100 percent for this 80 percent of that Yep. Now they decided, you know, forget that. We're not going to have everybody submitting their fees and doing all that stuff. We're going to send you the price, PPO. But mm -hmm. the price was 40% lower. And when we look at the macroeconomic data from the American Dental Association, their PhD economist, Marco, uh, 10 years ago, 2005, we peaked at $219,000 a year. And it's gone down about $4,000 a year. Now it's down to one seventy four. So when you look at the macro data, because of switching from indemnity to PPO and because of the rise of corporate dentistry, uh, incomes are falling from, you know, 219 to 174. Um, so the question is to you, 82% um, of the dental offices take PPOs and mm -hmm. every dental office in the big city is sitting across the street from big corporate boxes. So, mm -hmm. um, is that just the fact of life that every year we're just going to make less money than the year before? Or how, how do you handle PPOs and competing against dental service organizations when you're just a single mom and pop practice? Actually, that's a great question. And my initial thought that comes to mind is there's always, a, there's always, it's a depends and there's always a case by case scenario. So I, the way that not only I think about this, but would approach this is it depends on the dentist and the type of dentistry that they provide. And what I mean is the services they provide. So, and also too, it's the belief system, not only the business belief system of that practitioner, but it's also their technical belief system because some, some dentists, you know, don't like to do sealants and others do. Um, so to answer your question, I really think that it depends on the types of services that each of the dentists provide that is going to place their gross production and the revenues at the levels that they're desiring to do. But then also too, you have to take a look at the marketing efforts, the referral base efforts. There's so many, there, there's more than two handfuls of categories that go into that to to really take that question to the answer that it should be. But I also think it's case by case per, per, per practitioner. Well, if it's case by case, and one of my homies is listening to you right now, um, what's, what's your protocol? <laughs> Hi, homie. <laughs> what's your protocol for them telling you their, 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 their situation? Did you, do you prefer that they email you, call you, uh, write you a letter? What, what do you, how do they, uh, if they have a case by case, uh, um, you know, to talk about their special scenario, how can they talk to you about it? 
Yeah, they can just send an email to um, Diana at dentalperformanceinstitute.com or they can even go to our website to our contact form and I'd be happy to, to speak with them. So Diana you know, with one N, D-I-A-N-A. D-I-A-N-A at dentalperformanceinstitute.com. Did, Di did the uh, lady Diana, the, the queen of England, was that one in or two? Was she one. Sp she spelled like you? She was one. You know, I, I don't like the word performance because I always miss that in grammar school. I'd always spell it P-R-E. So if you're, right, if you're trying to find dentalperformance.com, it's dental per, P-E-R, performance. I, that was one. I could never get performance, Connecticut, or, or Albuquerque. I think I miss those every single time. So if they email you, um, um, you'll, they, you, they can email you their uh, exact deal, or if they go to dentalperformanceinstitute.com, you, what, you got a, a contact form that they fill out and tell you what's to bother them, or? How's that yeah, work? and you know what? It, it's very brief. They can say, you know, I, I heard you on uh, Howard Fran's podcast. I'll know exactly what they're speaking about. Um, they can put a very brief summary in there, and I'll call them back or, you know, schedule a time with them to speak for about 30 minutes to an hour, depending on what their situation is. So you've been, you've been in, how, you've, how long have you been in the dental field? I've actually been in the dental field since I was 16 years old in, in high school, like an after school job. That's actually how I got started in the dental field. So 30 years. So the, the kids are coming out of school thinking, uh, oh, come on, Howard. It was so much easier when you got out of school in 87. You didn't have corporate. You didn't have PPOs, blah, 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 blah. And a lot of these kids are asking specifically on Dentaltown. They're saying, do you think graduating as a dentist in 2016 with $350,000 in student loans, do you think I messed up? Do you think it was a bad idea? Or do you think there's a future uh, for a new dentist age 25, $350,000 in debt uh, right now in 2016. To start a new practice? Well, I mean, just graduating school with a license. I mean, do you think, she, you think she's going to pay those bills back? Do you think she's got opportunities like I did 30 years ago? What, what that, would you advise her? You know, that's a great question. I just had this conversation yesterday. So what we're seeing is there's three categories of uh, – within the dental industry. You have the uh, students slash dentists that are just coming out of school. You know, back in the day, you could put up a shingle and, and get a brick and mortar and start a business, then they'd be waiting out the door. That's not the way it is anymore. So what we're seeing is very few, less than 1% are actually going to open up a business. They usually either, you know, hire on with a with a uh, existing office or hire on with a corporate company so they can learn the industry, get their debt down. And if they have that entrepreneurial uh, mindset, background, spirit, whatever it may be, then they may go start another business in three to five years. Then you have the clients that are, you know, been out of school for five to 10 years, they've paid their debt down and now either they're gonna stay where they're at as an associate or become partner in the business where they are or they're gonna go out and start their own business. Then you have the clients that are, uh, or the category, excuse me, that are got maybe three to five, maybe seven more years to practice. They're trying to find their place in the dental world is for retirement. You know, do they have enough equity, not just, you know, money, you know, not just financial equity, but operational equity in that practice to make them attractive for a buyer? So they're like, okay, well, you know, some of my friends are going toward corporate America to sell. You know, some people are tr doing an acquisition transition with a family member. What should I do? So we see those are the three that are coming out. And we can actually, you know, speak with each of these categories, wherever that person may be, and give them some guidance of, you know, whatever their current situation is, of how, you know, where they should go next or what they should do. Well, do you want to talk about each one of them? So, so the, the, the three categories, you want to go into what you're telling them or anything? or Yeah, absolutely. So usually the, the um, uh, first category, the people, the students slash now uh, licensed dentists that are coming out, you know, we take a look at their debt. We figure out what's going on to see, you know, we ask them some questions too. We do some discovery to find out, you know, are they ready to start their own business? Do they have the capital to start their own business? And usually they don't. And it's a lot more than 350000 coming out with debt, depending, you know, what they took on, where they graduated, what have you. So, you know, we'll speak with them. And the well, majority- What kind of debt are you seeing? Oh, five fifty. For, just, for walking out of dental school? For walking out of dental school. 550 or 600? 
Six, yeah, the highest I saw was 650, and that was with somebody that just took on um, loan after loan after loan after loan. I mean, they just, <laughs> that, that was a personal situation. They didn't have a choice to do that. But What do you, what do you have, a stay-at-home wife that had three kids in dental school? I, I think, you know, they, well, it's more of a personal situation. Okay. I, but it was, sorry, it was, sorry, so, so, when, so continue. So these, these kids come out okay. of school, they got a bunch of debt. What, what advice yeah, and do you And they them? usually, the bottom line with them is they're looking for a practice where they can get experience. And that's usually how we guide them. Unless, unless you know, they have very little debt and they do have experience to open up a business, but the majority of them don't. So we guide them to say, you may want to get out in the world, uh, into the dental world, get some experience, then figure out where you want to be in three to five years, get your debt down, go that route. Um, the middle category with people, with the dentist and the practitioners that they've practiced for three to five years and now they got their debt down and then they're speaking with us. We're looking at the debt that they're in, what they have, you know, if they're, they're like, you know what, now we either want to acquire a practice or we want to uh, build out a startup. So we'll put them in touch with people that can help them, our trusted advisory partners, and then they'll work with them and figure out, you know, uh, do should they do an acquisition transition? Should they do a startup practice? It, it really depends on the individual and what they're looking for. And then where we've actually really been working in the last year and a half is that third category um, to help these practices become attractive for a sale because either these practices are so far in debt um, they don't have the operational or the financial equity to make them attractive for a sale or, you know, their location is outdated. So we'll help them either on the operational component, the financial component, the team dynamics, or you know, not really on the facelift of the practices, because that'll probably happen once they're acquired or transitioned or purchased. Um, but we'll help them get ready to be attractive for sale. How many times has an older dentist came to you and you analyzed everything and just said, you know what, I need to take you to the vet and just put you down? You know what? I would say less than 0.5%. <laughs> that you've had to put down at the vet? That I would say, you know what, it's probably time to broker this practice. Okay, I, I want to I ask you about the owner. You know, some things in dentistry got a lot better and some things in dentistry over the 30 years I, I thought went the wrong way. Like, I, I think switching out all the fillings from amalgams that last 38 years to white plastic crap that looks pretty in the last six and a half years was a good <laughs> idea. If I was a pretty blonde woman like you, I get it. But if it's some boy with a burger hanging out of his nose, his hair's matted up, he's worn the same shirt three <laughs> days in a row, he doesn't know what floss is, why the hell are you putting white plastic composites in his molars that even his own mother won't see? But one of the things that really grinds my gears is back in the day when a seller would sell the office, they mm. would usually carry. And what I liked about that is if it, back in 1987, he'd say, okay, I'll sell you this practice for 500 grand and it's gonna, and it's gonna be 10% interest for seven years. Well, the mm. interest over those seven years was almost the same amount as what he sold the practice for. So he sold right. his practice and then over the next seven years, he made that money again, the interest. But what I liked about it is he had skin in the game. So right. he knew if you weren't going to be able to pull this off, he wasn't going to put his own money on the line. And he knew right. this person could pull it off. And then he's incentivized to be walking around to, you know, the grocery stores and the church and the parking lot saying, oh, my God, you should go to Dr. Diana. She is the best. Um, you know, I'm so lucky that she bought my practice. And now the banks took over because they want that money. Mm -hmm. And now I see dentists in Phoenix that sell an office for seven fifty to some uh -huh. kid who got a co-signer who doesn't even know what day it is. They just walked out of school and that office was doing seven fifty and the first year they do like three fifty. I mean they just run it into the ground and the de seller doesn't care because he got his money and ran. So I, I like to sell care. So I want to ask you specifically two questions or one other yes. question. If you're gonna buy a practice, there's a big mm -hmm. threat on Dental Town right now and it's a mile and a half long. Um, they all want to know how long should the seller be there? That is a great question. And personally, I, you know, again, it's a dependent case by case, but the bottom line with this is the seller sh should stay on within uh, 30 to 90 days. Could be longer than that. 
But what we're seeing is the owner, I'm sorry, the new owner, the buyer, now new owner is the other person's either part partner, associate, whatever their contractual agreement is, is that they feel that they can't run or operate the practice at the levels they want to because the previous owner, now associate, is still dictating what's happening in that practice. So what we're finding is the communication prior to that sale is just not happening properly. It's just, you know what, let's just all throw it on paper, throw it against the wall. Let's see, you know, it's spaghetti. Let's see what sticks to the wall. And then when the rubber hits the road, when these two doctors are in the practice, they're butting heads left and right. So what, you know, if we can actually work with the client prior to that transition, we will help them to structure the uh, communi communicative points of what to do within the first 30, 60, 90 days, you know, but, you know, I've even seen doctors that have stayed on two years, you know, it, it just really, really depends on what's happening within that scenario. And I want you to talk about this because a lot of uh, millennials, I mean, like say I, uh, you know, I don't, I don't care uh, um, pigment of your skin or your genitalia. I, I want to know how old you are because I believe how the age probably impacts how you think more than any mm -hmm. other variable I've seen, even going around the world. I mean, like my boy's grandfather has more money than you and I will ever have, but he was a depression era kid, so he won't right. spend a penny. That's one of the reasons he has so much money, because he just can't spend anything. I mean, he lived through when the whole country, you know, tw 32 to 36, 24% unemployment, you know, the depression, they'll never forget that. But here, here's what I hear millennials saying, you know what? I love my classmate, Shirley. We were best friends all through school. We're going to go start a practice together. And I always say, wait a minute. When you get married and you have great sex and children and family and holidays and vacation, that fails mm -hmm. half the time. Mm -hmm. Now you're going to marry a dental school classmate with no sex, no children, no vacations, no holidays, none of them social glues that keep holding it together. What do you think of partnerships? Do they fail as much as divorce? <laughs> well, with this type of partnership, the main portion of whether it, it works or it fails is the money involved. Because if, if the two practitioners do not structure the partnership properly, it will fail. I've seen partnerships where they go in by their word, it's all verbal, it's a handshake, and it falls apart in a couple of years. Then I've also seen partnerships where they do it properly, they put the contracts together, they know whose part is what part and what they're gonna be doing, and it worked beautifully. So, so I, can't you're say, say so what, you're saying, I can't say what percentage work and what doesn't. So you're saying get a prenuptial agreement. I'm saying get a get a business prenuptial agreement. Get and a, they should put a do contract it, in place to protect yourself. And when you tell them to do that in marriage, they look at you like, no, you don't get it. I'm in love. This is my soulmate. This is that. And they, they, they just think getting a prenuptial for marriage or getting a prenuptial for us two best friends in college. I mean, you're just... You're just being a fart. You're raining on my, you're not romantic. Well, in this case, it's business. Business is business. And if you're going to go into a partnership with somebody who's a friend, a colleague, uh, a college roommate or what have you, it's still business. And again, it's that fine line of crossing from, you know, business owner into friendship. But, you know, again, that's where a very uh, solid uh, professional, experienced, trusted advisor can come in and make sure that both of them are protected on a business level where hopefully there will not be any headaches down the road. And if they are, they revisit their contract and they put an addendum into it. Okay. I want to tell you that uh, I told you if I lined up a hundred dentists said, what is your biggest problem? The number one is always, always on uh, staff. No, no yep. question. Number two is this, and it's coming from the old and the young. I don't want to buy old man McGregor's practice because he gave these girls a raise every time the earth went around the sun. It was based on astrology, and his labor is flipping <laughs> way high as he's transitioned from indemnity insurance to 40% less PPOs, and they say this labor is out of control. It's an all-PPO practice, and they're like, you know, I don't want to buy this practice in, in a small town of Salina, 
and then go in there and fire the five ladies that have worked there for 30 years and replace them with someone half that. So, so just talk about that. And there's a lot of older dentists who say, you know, they, they, they look at their overhead and they say, well, yeah, but my overhead's really, really high because I have these five great girls who've been with me for 30 years and I'm on the astrology system. So every time the earth passes Uranus, I gave them another dollar. So, so what do you, what do you do when the, when the insurance fees are coming down and the overhead's going up? So, so talk, talk about that and, and overhead yeah. in general. Absolutely. So I'm even going to backtrack just a little bit to come to that point. Uh, one of the areas that I highly recommend that dentists start to do is bring in a consultant to evaluate the operational components of that practice prior to the sale. Now, some transition companies would probably shoot me in the head right now, but what we're finding is Yes, the, the, the brokers and the transition companies, they all put it down on paper, they do a great job. But one of the things that we see is they're not really comprehensively evaluating the insurances, the um, uh, the case inventory, you know, the recare department, they are to a certain point, but then also the AR and the AR is a whole nother issue. But to, to there's a answer lot of, your- There's a lot of people that don't know what you mean by AR. They're young I'm kids. sorry, account, the accounts receivable. Some offices purchase the accounts receivable in a transaction, some don't. It just depends on, you know, how that transaction is structured. So when it comes to the insurances, and again, that also comes to the services that the dentists are providing. If your seller is providing a higher level of services and is a, you know not taking as many PPOs, and then you have this other dentist that's the seller coming in to buy the practice, and they're PPO driven, they just do bread and butter dentistry, you're going to have a disconnect. So the seller should really know what types of services are being provided in that practice and what the insurances are that are being accepted or not being accepted, so they can make an informed decision. Uh, that's where we're seeing the disconnect right now is because the operational components are not being analyzed and there's also equity in those operational components so when the seller comes in and they say or yeah when the seller uh when the let's see so i'm sorry when the buyer comes in they actually know where they can start to rebuild that practice to rebuild that equity to get it up to the levels that it should be okay so let's assume that you and i both do this for another 30 years and you do this from 46 to 56 66 76 you'll, you'll probably be doing this 76 my buddy bob maybe, ibsen maybe 65. i don't know my, my my buddy bob ibsen who invented rembrandt and started denmat and all that he was he was d- treating patients till he dropped at 84. and uh, wow. oh my god congratulations yeah but but here here's here's the question here's the specific question um in healthcare, when you and i were little when we were in grammar school most of the physicians were solo but then they started inventing all these technologies like MRIs, CAT scans, ultrasounds, and it just didn't make, I can't buy all this equipment and not share it among a group practice. So technology purchases drove group practice in healthcare. So the yes. question is, a lot of these young kids are saying, well, do I need to buy, do I need to do same day dentistry and invest $150,000 in a CERAC machine and $100,000 in a CBCT machine? and a hundred thousand dollar laser to be successful and if i need all those three things then are you saying group practice is actually the future or do you actually see successful dentists that are crushing it that don't have a hundred fifty thousand dollar stack machine a hundred thousand dollar cbc machine and an 85 or a hundred twenty thousand dollar laser yeah, absolutely. I see dentists that are, are, like you said, crushing it, and they don't have a laser. They don't have a CEREC machine. Um, they have interoral cameras. They have panoramic and you know uh, uh, certain you know X-ray machines, and they're doing fine. Um, but then on the other hand, I do see dentists that have CEREC machines or other machines like that. Um, I don't really come across a lot that have laser unless they're periodontists or you know they're doing. Uh, Lenap or whatever it may be, very few and far between. But yeah, I see dentists that don't have all the toys that are doing very well. Dude, on average, when the dentist has a CIRAC machine, on average, is are they doing better financially? Uh, do they have more net income than the ones that don't? Or do you, do you, do you, when you see people making a lot of money, are they more likely to have a lot of expensive technology or less likely? I don't, I wouldn't say it's expensive technology. I would say that they have revised or industry standard at this point technology. So 
you know, the CEREC machine has a very large, long learning curve. And if that learning curve isn't taken into consideration, that will actually drop the dentist production. Um, with the CT scan, you know, that's a different ball game because not only can you use it internally for your own office, you can actually market that to the other offices or even medical facilities in the area. So, I mean, there's there's some play with that that you can actually make some extra income and, you know, uh, work that route. Um, so I would say that, again, it's case by case, and depending on how motivated that doctor is, if they're going to train their team members to be part of utilizing that certain technology, such as, you know, CEREC or a CAD-CAM type of uh, machine, because, you know, if you utilize your dental assistants, then actually you can schedule at a different capacity. So, you know, again, I just think it's, it's, the, it's the technical belief system of the dentist and, you know, how how high level they want to get with the types of services they're going to provide to their patients and with their time management. My, my best analogy that I, that I tell my friends is that, you know, getting a CEREC machine uh, or a CBCT is like getting a, a guitar or a piano. Anybody mm -hmm. can buy a guitar. But you said the learning curve is long, and it's twice as long as anybody even thinks it is. It might yes, be it three is. times longer than your longest estimate. You're not going to buy a piano and be Beethoven by the end of the month. I mean, yeah. it's going to take years <laughs> and years and years of practice. And, and, and some people like that stuff. But mm -hmm. if you don't like that stuff and you're just buying it for return on investment, you know, that, 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 that's a mixed match. Um, I, I'm going to go to another um, um, very stressful thing. There's so many dentists out there that are looking at their uh, high overhead and all these PPOs, and they hear these PPO consultants that if I call up you and give you money, you're going to call up all the PPOs I use, and you're going to increase all my fees, and I'm going to make more money and not have to drop my PPO. So they're always thinking, is, is that a fantasy? I mean, is that like dreaming that you saw the tooth fairy riding a unicorn, and you're going to give some PPO consultant a thousand bucks, and she's going to raise all your fees? And then the fear dark side of that is that, uh, God dang, I, some of these insurance plans are so low. I feel like I should drop them, but I'm scared to drop them. Talk about, talk about PPOs, Medicaid, Medicare. Okay. Um, See, what, when we what were... I do is I throw so many bullshit questions out there. I'm hoping one of them is good. And you just yeah, buy no, actually, the, these <laughs> questions are great. I'm hoping I'm answering them at the high quality level you, you're expecting. So anyway, as far as the PPO uh, insurances are concerned, we've actually worked with clients to evaluate their insurance programs. So what we do is we actually collect all of their information from each of the PPOs they're on. Uh, we do an impact analysis, not only with their office fees, but the fees that they have with each of these PPO plans. And then we also match them to the consolidators that are in the industry. And I'm not going to say, you know, the exact, I don't even know if I can say the exact names of those companies, but basically what those companies do is they go into the major dental insurance companies and they renegotiate the fees. So they have a higher fee schedule um, where they can actually offer it to the dentist if the dentist decides to go with the consolidator. So we will do an impact analysis and a utilization report of all the patients in their practice to find out which ones are the most prominent ones, which ones they're making the best money at, and which ones are, are the low ones that maybe you can, that maybe that the practitioner could kind of back out of. And then we put this all together, we present it to the client, we help them to make an informed decision. Now, depending on what they want to do, if they're a single location practice is very, it's what we're finding, and I'm sure there's other companies out there that this is what they specialize in, but we're finding is that if they're just a single location practice, then their GP, it's very challenging to um, get their fees raised to a certain point, but we've done it. Um, but it seems like that, and then specialty practices, if there's a specialty practice in the area that is, don't have an abundant amount around with the same type of specialty, the insurance companies are more prone to negotiate those fees and the specialty fee schedules are usually higher anyway. Um, but where the bang for the buck hits is the more locations you have, the more likely certain insurance companies are going to be to negotiate. So just understanding that and that there's a lot of work that goes into that and but one of the caveats that i want to say is if you're going if any uh company or any dental practice is going to work with the company to help them to do this type of service 
it's going to take a while to negotiate those fees. It's not going to be overnight. What we're seeing right now is sometimes three, six to nine months on negotiating fees if we can negotiate them at all. So you're so yeah. So in summary, if you're a solo practice, you're just not going to be be playing on the same level as a corporation that has fifty offices. You got that right. But I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say never say never. But understand, it's probably not going to be as likely unless you have, you know, a growing DSO or multiple location practices. Well, uh, never say never, but you really should just never smoke meth. I've been, a, <laughs> I've been a dentist in Phoenix, and whenever I do a denture, they live in a trailer and they're smoking meth. So I can say with <laughs> certitude, never smoke meth, especially. No, I would say that in heroin. Stay away from heroin. Especially heroin if you live at a yeah, but you know the heroin addicts, it, it's a different deal because um, you know you uh, we'll, we'll take some of these rock stars. They probably don't want their names called out, but like the lead singer of Aerosmith, Peter Frampton, Eric Clapton, <laughs> they did heroin for ten years. I know. And then they quit and they're fine. But right. you do meth for a oh. year. You are permanently dumber, brain dead. Mm -hmm. And um, the biggest mistakes I've ever made in my life was fixing up doing dentistry on meth heads. And, you know, a year later, it's just all mush. It turns mm -hmm. off their saliva. And I don't care how good your dentistry is, it's all going to fail. Yeah. And now it's a standard question is uh, if you have if you have not stopped math for at least six months, then that tooth needs to be extracted. I don't care if it's even just a cavity. I mean, you uh -huh. don't even do a filling in a meth head. I mean, it's just the only money with a return on investment is an extraction if you're smoking yeah. meth. So that's the only time you can say never. OK, <laughs> gotcha. Um, so. Um, so how does my homie. Um, find out which PPOs are better than, so So he's listening to you. If, if I say to Dennis, if I say to this, well, how many insurance plans uh, are you uh, participating in? I mean, he, he never, he, he doesn't even know what that. He, he, he doesn't have a clue. And no, then what's don't. also funny is whenever he has a complaint, he's like, oh, Delta, blah, 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 blah. It's like a 90% chance it wasn't even Delta. They just, they always say Delta because that's the only brand they know. But how many dental insurance companies, let me ask you this specifically. If your office, if, if you're talking to a dentist that's 40, 50 years old, on average, how many different dental insurance plans are they participating on? And when you work with them, how many of them do you usually say, let's not take those and let's concentrate on those? Well, again, I can't, I can't inform them that way until I do the analysis. No, no I'm just saying um, of your but, average clients. Yeah. Um, I've had clients where I walk in and they just hand me a list of every insurance company <laughs> that's in their system. Um, and then I have clients that are only on maybe four or five. Um, but it's there. We all know who the major insurance companies are. Um, but then, you know, then you have the, the union, you have, you know, locals, you, you have a lot of other different types of insurance companies. But I think if there's anything that I can advise dental clients on when they're looking at their insurances is, you know, if you have Cigna, find out if you're in network with Cigna, find out what plans you're in network with with Cigna because Cigna has, you know, they've changed their other plans around. And I'm just using them as an example. They used to have two or three plans and now they've combined the two plans into one plan and then they have a federal plan. So I think it, what I advise my clients to do or any client, even if it's a potential client or if they're not even a client of ours is, you know, comprehensively look at your insurance plans and, you know, if you're with Cigna, what plans are you under with Cigna? If you're with Guardian, what plans are you under with Guardian? If you're with MetLife, what plans are you under with MetLife? And are you under any federal plans? Because then the federal plans, their, uh, their fee schedules are different, or if there's a state plan. So I can't really say that, you know, clients have they have either four they have 15 they have 25 and then they're with the consolidators and consolidators and it doesn't even matter because if you have a direct contract with an insurance company the consolidators aren't going to matter anyway because the direct contract supersedes the consolidator and the consolidator has a better fee schedule so to and i know i'm going in a roundabout way with this but the bottom line is is dental offices 
they struggle with insurance because they want to get to the penny for the patient and it's just never going to happen. It's either approximated or estimated. So if there's any category of an operational function in a dental practice that I would say to explore and understand better, it's the insurance department. Okay, I'm, I'm going, I'm on the, uh, so on Dental Town, uh, we have the app. So there's 217,000 dentists on the website and 50,000 of them have downloaded the app and there's 50 categories. One of them's practice management. And uh, one of the most common practice management questions ever asked though is, okay, I, want, I need a practice management information system. And Henry Schein owns Dentrix, uh, Patterson owns Eaglesoft. There's a, you know, there's a whole bunch. You, you've worked with how many different practice management softwares have you worked with? So could you give me any advice on picking a practice management software? If you're trying to run your business better, I mean, do you like some more than others? When some client has this software, do you say, oh, that's good? When people call with another software, do you say, oh, that sucks? Or well, what are your thoughts on practice management software? Well, I think it also, too, comes back to um, the age of the dentist. Because in this day and age, you know, the younger dentists, they're all, they want to go cloud-based. That's all they want to look at. They, you know, if they want to look at Eaglesoft or Dentrix, do you have a cloud-based system? Um, so cloud-based systems are good for some things and they're, you know, some are not good for others. Um, but right now, my professional opinion, being a consultant and a trusted advisor, I like the reporting aspects of systems. So, you know, I, I do like Eaglesoft. I like Dentrix. Um, I've worked with Open Dental. I've worked with Dentrix The Send. Um, if I if there was any advice I would give to a client, I would ask them question of what questions of what's important to them within a software system, and then from what I know about the software systems, I would guide them to take a look at this system over this system and this system. I give I give them three systems to look at. That's actually how I would approach that conversation. So what are your because three it's, systems? It's, Dentrix, Eaglesoft, and what was the third? Open Dental is really big right now. Yeah, you know, I you know when I when you're just on Dental Town, it seems like the threads on uh, um, Dentrix and Eaglesoft are just complaint forms, and as Open Dental it seems like the only one that has raving fans. Because it's very user friendly, and the reporting system's pretty easy to understand. See, I thought it was because they're based out of Oregon, and pot is legal there, so the programmers the programmers are probably a little more laid back and less that uptight. Could be. <laughs> Um, so, um, I know, um, here, here's another question they always ask on the practice management software. I mean, on the practice management system is, uh, they're young and I try to stay with young questions on podcasting because all the data on podcasters is they're not grandpas like me. I mean, I got a four year old granddaughter, all the data on podcasting is, uh, they're usually all 30 and under. And one okay. of the biggest questions 30 and younger, um, is asking is they're saying, uh, Diana, I've worked at Aspen now for three years, and I start jonesing to start my own, but then I'm scared. How do I know I'm ready to jump? Because you talk about, in a lot of your stuff, like entrepreneurial DNA, how does she know when she says, hey, cool your horses, stay at Aspen for another year, or no, you're ready to dive in? Well... Part of the entrepreneurial DNA, and that's just a whole other category, there is a book out there by Joe Abraham called Entrepreneurial DNA and Discovering, you know, what your primary and your secondary entrepreneurial DNA is. Um, but we would sit down with that person and ask them questions uh, depending on what they're looking to do, how they're looking to do it, you know, how they would handle certain scenarios being a business owner because going from an associate to a uh, business owner is a huge paradigm shift and you know if they don't answer the questions in certain ways or don't have certain competencies to be an entrepreneur or a business owner we'll advise them they you know maybe this isn't for you um, or we would direct them to read that book and give them some ideas of you know what their entrepreneurial DNA is are they a builder are they you know an opportunist you know are they more of a safety type individual um, so not everybody is an entrepreneur. They're just not. They don't. They don't have. They think they are, but they don't have the drive, the desire to, um, you know, take it for the long haul. Because be, being a business owner, I mean, you're you're not going to get your return on investment. The majority of the time, after one or two years, it takes a good four, five, six years to, you know, get your feet wet. You know, start turning a paycheck, 
build a big strong you know a large not large but depending on the type of business you're looking to build so you know we have some the discovery questions we ask them and then uh, point them in the right direction where you know if they should open a practice and spend all that money or acquire a practice or you know whatever they're looking to do in the next uh, three to five years all right so uh you're uh you're amazing now i want to know um what are they going to find on if they go to dental performance institute dental performance institute.com uh mm -hmm. what are what are they going to find on your website but well, when they come to the website they're going to see a picture of me and then they're going to see some flash uh news and then on the front page they're going to see the the business or i'm sorry the services that we offer to dental practices whether they're a single location a group practice a multi-location or a growing dso because we're doing some really good strong work with the growing dso from zero to five uh six to ten practices zero, on zero to five operations. six to ten yeah helping wow. them to standardize their operations uh, organize their operations, putting in place their middle management. Um, we don't help them structure their board of directors or anything on a legal aspect. We really help with the operational <laughs> components, the team dynamics, and you know, helping to, to position them where if they're, they are going to buy multiple practices and they're going to scale, that they're being able to take the operational logistics from one practice and mirror it into the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. So, you know, if you have team members going from one office to another, they're not saying, we don't do it in this office. We don't do it like that in this office. And it's standardized all the way across the board, all the operational components. So, so um, is that a big part of your business now, growing DSOs, that growing from one to two to three? Absolutely. If you, absolutely. If you, just, you know, I've never done that. I never done that. I'm still at one office 30 years later. I, uh, you know, I was lecturing. I had uh, four kids. Uh, Eric Gray Grant and Zach. I uh, started Dental Town. You know all that stuff. I, I just never. I never had enough time. And uh, yeah, but well, but yeah. but now but but now I I always thought that would be fun to go from one to two to three. I would like to start that journey. But I but in my walnut brain, I'd have to start with the full time employee first. I mean, I'd have to mm -hmm. have someone come and say, I want to work for you full time and do that because uh, mm -hmm. you know you. I would just need that team member. If that team member appeared, I'd probably go that route. Yep. yep. I, I really yep. would. Um, so, uh, so do you, do you think, uh, so a lot, the data shows that, um, that right now, um, corporate dentistry, meaning, you know, multiple locations in multiple states has 12 to 14% of the market. Where do you Correct. think that's going to be in a decade? <laughs> that's a good question. And we just talked about this, uh, at our workshop, uh, back in July. Um, there, the opinion, the opinion of doctors and trusted advisory partners is that it's going to grow to 25%. That's part of the opinion. The other is what goes up must come down. So some people are saying that number may stay the same. It may go up, you know, a few percentage points. Um, but, and then some are like, it's just going to take over the market. So I think that question depends on who you ask. If you're asking me, I think there's a place in the dental industry for everybody. There's a place for the single brick and mortar location. There's a place for, uh, you know, group practice. There's a place for multi-location. There's a place for, you know, large corporate dental practices. I think there's, there's enough business in our marketplace to take care of these patients at the level that the patient feels that they deserve to be taken care of. So uh, go ahead. That that's my professional opinion. I, 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 think, I think it's going to go up and it's going to come down. That's my professional opinion. Yeah, it always does. Housing prices, stock market, even fracking. I mean, even fracking. But what I don't understand is, you know, we're, we're not making a, a, a product. We're not making a cell phone. We're not making a, it's not an assembly line. The main reasons I never went to uh, uh, corporate uh, multiple locations is because I didn't, didn't see the unique selling proposition. I mean, the, 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 the most unique selling proposition in dentistry is the doctor-patient relationship. And, mm -hmm. and when I'm eating at a Mexican restaurant, what is the advantage that it's part of a coast-to-coast -coast 3,000 corporate Mexican restaurant chain? When I'm getting a Manny Petty, which I get a lot of because my brother's gay, and there's only a Nothing few, wrong with that. There's only a, a few activities that we share in common. And, but when I'm getting a Manny Petty, what advantage of it if that lady is part of a thousand person chain or like even going to massage envy 
You know, when, mm -hmm. when you go into a corporate deal, I, it's actually harder to get a table and an appointment time uh, than if you just go to the, the single shop. So in right. a service operation, uh, I, I, don't, I don't get the scale of economy. I, I think a lot of corporate is driven by, I, I think it'll be driven by the percentage of graduates that come out of school that just mm -hmm. want a job and at five o'clock they're done and they just want to go home and be a mom or a dad and do homework and baseball and take the kids to Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts. Because if you own your own business, you're going to, you're, you're going to, that it's, it's going to be a lifestyle change. Yes. So I think if the lifestyle is, I think if 25% of the dentists want to be a soccer mom, that's what percent will be corporate. I think if, if 50% want to be a soccer mom, that'll be corporate because uh, owning your own business is not an eight to five job. It is a no, lifestyle. It's not. And no, if you don't it, want it's that, not. And look at how that's changed from baby boomers. I mean, you realize after World War II in 1945, average American woman was having five and a half kids. Mm -hmm. Now, now it's half that amount. So, like, like I was, you know, part of seven kids. Less than that. Yeah, my my mom and dad were Catholic, so they had seven kids in three days. And uh, you know, I mean, if, if if you come out of school and say <laughs> I ain't having seven kids in three, I mean, I'm just not doing it. I mean, I think I had a small family because I only had four. And now of those four boys, only one of them's had one. So, right. so I, I think it's, again, it goes back to the way they think, which you can't see based on skin pigment, genitalia. It's going to come down to how the dental graduates think. And right. that's going to be largely invisible uh, until you ask them. But hey, Diana. But also, too, you know what I, I think, too, is a last point. It's not only what they think, it is how they are uh what they're hearing in our industry and what people are doing and you know because what i'm hearing too from new graduates well if so and so is doing it i can do it well you may want to explore that option because again if that person is entrepreneurial and they're scaling up a business and you don't have the certain competen competencies or entrepreneurial dna that that person has it's not going to work for you so there's got to be more exploratory questions to be asked and looked at instead of just making a quick rat a quick decision to say you know what that's what i'm going to do it, it's it just doesn't work that way in our industry anymore because our industry has changed so much the dynamic changes are, are are amazing all right well hey i can't believe we're already in overtime that was the fastest hour of the day uh i had a blast talking to you i just think it's so amazing that i can get someone with 30 years experience to come on my show and talk to all well, my thank homies you. And share, Hi, homies. and share everything they've learned in three decades. They, they love it. They absolutely love it. The emails I get on this are just, there. I mean, I, that's why I won't stop. I mean, they just keep saying, dude, I just graduated an hour ago. I've, I've, I've listened to 400 of your shows. Uh, it, it's just amazing. Thank you for sharing your time, giving back. Uh, thank you for all that you've done, Diana. Thanks for being on my show today. Yeah, and thank you for inviting our company in to be part of your podcast. We appreciate it. Yeah, and I, and I want to remind my homies, uh, no one pays to get on here. It's no commercial. And I called Diana. She didn't call me. I mean, I know the buzz on Dental Town. I mean, 217,000 dentists have posted 4 million times. So when I, I keep hearing good things, I, I want to get you on my show. And that's why the show thank is good. Thank you so much. Because I get thank people you. like you. All thank right. You. Have a rocking hot day. Bye, Dental World. Speak to you soon.